Patient D is a 66-year-old male who has been under your dental care for the past 10 years. He is considered a high-risk patient with numerous medical issues. He has a history of hypertension and his current blood pressure is 150 over 90. He takes several blood pressure medications, including a cardioselective beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor. Patient D had a heart attack called a myocardial infarction, or MI, six years ago that was treated promptly with a cardiac catheterization and stent placement. He continues to have exertional angina due to coronary atherosclerosis and is prescribed nitroglycerin as needed. Angina is the sensation of chest pain that can occur due to ischemia of the cardiac muscle. He also suffers from macular degeneration and takes 300 milligrams Neurontin daily for peripheral neuropathy. Patient D previously smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, but quit over 10 years ago after encouragement from his family and general physician. Due to his numerous health issues, he is unable to exercise regularly, but has recently been attempting to eat a healthier diet. You have performed many dental procedures on patient D over the past decade, including deep periodontal scalings and routine direct restorative dentistry. Patient D reports to your practice today for an emergency visit with a large buccal cusp fracture on tooth number 20. Your office is extremely busy today, tending to five recall and seven operative patients. But patient D called the office this morning, reporting a severe amount of pain to cold and heat. Given your long-standing history with the patient, you decide to squeeze him into your already busy schedule. While waiting on another patient's anesthesia, you inject patient D with two carpules of 4% septocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine for an inferior alveolar block. While in a hurry, you forgot to aspirate the injection site and continued with anesthesia. Immediately following the injection, patient D begins sweating and he reports that his heart is racing and he feels nervous. You must act quickly. What do you think has happened to your patient? He is experiencing A. Anxiety due to dental phobia after viewing the needle B. A pain response to the injection C. The fight or flight response due to the injection or D. An allergic reaction to the dental anesthetic You first eliminate response D, as the patient is not exhibiting any wheezing or respiratory distress. It is quite possible that the patient is experiencing fear or pain regarding the procedure, but this is surprising given his long-standing history with you. The patient has never experienced any prior episodes of dental phobia and has always appeared to have a high tolerance for pain. Is there any reason why he would suddenly be experiencing these fight-or-flight-like symptoms? After considering all of your options, you realize that in your haste you've made a key mistake. Patients with a high cardiovascular risk should not be given injections containing epinephrine. Vasoconstrictors, like epinephrine, are used in conjunction with local anesthetics to keep the drugs acting locally and to decrease the rate of systemic absorption of the anesthetic. However, your injection has accidentally penetrated the inferior alveolar artery, and epinephrine is coursing through the patient's bloodstream. Your mind quickly revisits your first year dental physiology course and considers the effects of epinephrine on the body. Epinephrine is a catecholamine produced in the adrenal medulla that is responsible for the fight or flight response. The sympathetic nervous system is often referred to as the fight or flight system. This name is derived from the fact that it is initiated during times of mental or physical stress to the body. The main goal of the sympathetic nervous system is to mobilize the body's resources in order to withstand the stressor. Epinephrine has many effects within the body including an increased heart rate and contractility, arteriolar constriction in the renal splanchnic or cutaneous circulatory beds, bronchodilation, an increased alertness, anxiety, and fear, and sweating. Now that you realize your mistake in treating this patient, you start pondering your options for treatment. 
After sitting the patient up from the supine position, what steps should you take to remedy the situation? A. Continue with the procedure while the patient is still anesthetized. B. Wait for the effects of the epinephrine to diminish before resuming treatment. Or C. Immediately call 911 for assistance. Before you can consider your options, the patient reports a crushing pain in his chest and a numb sensation extending down his left arm. Your worst fears confirmed, you realize that patient D is experiencing a severe episode of angina that could potentially lead to a myocardial infarction. You should immediately call 911. What is the most likely cause of the patient's angina? A, an increase in the preload of the heart. B, a decrease in the diastolic blood pressure. C, an increase in the heart rate. Or D, an increase in the coronary artery perfusion pressure. The correct answer is response C. Why would an increase in the heart rate make a patient more susceptible to angina? Let's consider two different situations. At the top of the screen, we will see an ECG tracing for a patient with a normal sinus rhythm. In this case, the patient's heart rate is 60 beats per minute. At the bottom of the screen, we will see an ECG tracing for a patient with sinus tachycardia due to the fight or flight response. In this case, the patient's heart rate has risen to 115 beats per minute. Systole is the time period in the cardiac cycle that the ventricles are actively contracting and is shown here outlined by a pink box. Diastole is the time period in the cardiac cycle that the ventricles are relaxing and is represented here by the blue box. The heart rate of an individual affects the amount of time that the heart spends in systole versus diastole. While the systolic period may decrease slightly with the increased heart rate, the diastolic period is drastically reduced. Why is this important? Diastole is the only period during the cardiac cycle that the coronary circulation is perfused. The coronary arteries are blood vessels on the surface of the heart that supply the myocardium with essential nutrients and oxygen. When the myocardium contracts during systole, the coronary blood vessels are squeezed shut, preventing any perfusion of the blood vessels. On the left side of the screen, we see the heart during a diastolic period. During diastole, the relaxed myocardium allows the coronary circulation to be adequately perfused, supplying the heart tissue with oxygen and nutrients. During systole, the contraction of the heart will be represented here as a darkening of the tissue. During systole, the smaller coronary blood vessels are constricted within the contracting muscle, causing a buildup of waste and carbon dioxide, represented here by the blue coloration of the blood. The lack of appropriate blood flow to the myocardium during this time is called ischemia, and the lack of necessary oxygen is called hypoxia. Let's compare animations of the coronary circulation with a normal versus a high or tachycardic heart rate. With a normal heart rate, there are still periods of brief ischemia and hypoxia during systole, but the long periods of diastole compensate for these issues. With tachycardia, the high heart rate decreases the diastolic intervals between contractions of the heart. This can lead to severe ischemia and hypoxia of the cardiac tissue. Patient D may also have been at a higher risk for cardiac ischemia due to his past history of atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a pathological condition in which cholesterol-containing plaques form in the walls of arteries. 
these plaques cause a decrease in the blood flow through the coronary circulation, making patient D even more susceptible to hypoxic episodes when an increase in heart rate occurs. With prolonged ischemia and hypoxia of the myocardium, tissue damage and death can occur, leading to a myocardial infarction, or MI. Patient D exhibited the classic signs of a myocardial infarction with a crushing pain in the chest and a numbness or tingling sensation down the left arm. Thus, this should be treated as an emergency situation. While not all cases of angina lead to an MI, given the high risk status of the patient, you should take all necessary precautions. What could you do to treat patient D? Emergency care should be summoned immediately and the patient should be administered a nitroglycerin tablet under his tongue. This drug should be included in dental emergency kits in the practice. Nitroglycerin is a fast-acting vasodilator that acts predominantly on the coronary circulation. Nitroglycerin is converted by the body into nitric oxide, a potent vasodilator. Nitroglycerin helps to restore appropriate blood flow to the myocardium. Emergency personnel should then take over and will most likely have to give additional drugs and or perform a cardiac catheterization to treat any blockages. Now that you have broadened your understanding of the treatment of patients with a high cardiovascular risk, try to answer the following multiple choice question. Tachycardia decreases the perfusion of the coronary circulation because A the coronary artery perfusion pressures increase due to an increased afterload. B, the cardiac output of the heart increases due to an increased stroke volume. C, the preload of the heart increases due to an increased filling time. Or D, the amount of time the ventricles spend in diastole is decreased over the span of a minute. Did you choose response D? If so, nice work. The perfusion of the coronary circulation would be decreased because the ventricles spend less time in diastole. During systole, the coronary circulation is squeezed shut by the myocardium. For response A, afterload could be increased in patient D due to the epinephrine administration, but the stem only specifically refers to the tachycardia. For responses B and C, the tachycardia would allow less filling time for the heart during diastole. So the preload of the heart should be decreased. Due to the Frank Starling mechanism, this would act to decrease the stroke volume and thus the cardiac output. Given the high incidence of heart disease in today's society, it is likely that you will have to treat many high risk patients in your dental practice. Steps must be taken during procedures to ensure that these patients receive the best dental care with minimal possible complications. Thank you for your assistance in solving this case.